you much for coming. Uh, I seem to be wearing quite a few hats here. Uh, first of all, I work for Tony Verstandig and Gene Case and uh, others being involved in the Aspen Institute's Middle East program. Secondly, I'm sort of here as the chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors because, uh, and there are, I think that is Steve Reddish here, the head of Voice of America, I mean, uh, deputy head of Voice of America. Quite a few people are here from our own international broadcasting efforts and uh, programs. And obviously, Duncan McKinnis is here, and you'll hear from him in a minute from the State Department who runs, he's the uh, DAS for, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the uh, International Information Program, if I'm correct. That's correct. But, uh, but the main reason uh, we're here is that I've had the great pleasure with the Aspen Institute, the Lebanon Renaissance uh, Foundation, Faraz, who is somewhere sitting here. Raise your hand, Faraz, if you would. Win the way back. We don't give him a seat. Uh, to be very much part of a U.S.-Lebanese dialogue that's incredibly important. I do think that for approximately 2,000 years, uh, that a little corner of the world there from uh, the Beirut area has been the key to, are we going to make it or are we not, is a successful world. And I love going to Beirut. I always learn a lot. But the reason I always learn a lot is I always learn it from Ali Huri, who is the head of quantum communications. He is sort of the Jay Chiat of uh, the world, meaning uh, the world's greatest advertising and communications person, but really also somebody who's been a glue that holds together civil society, uh, journalism, uh, many parts of the world in the Middle East. The most informed person I know about how to communicate in the Middle East. And uh, I know you're going to give us a little talk that'll have some historic reference, but when I was asked to be part of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, I thought, well, in 1945, 1946, when we engage in a whole new global struggle, uh, we did it based on the power of our ideas and our ability to communicate. And it took about 40 years, but by 1989, the Berlin Wall had come down. Yeah. And it had done so not simply because intermediate range nuclear missiles were positioned better. Uh, it was because we communicated, we had ideas, and the appeal of those ideas triumphed. That's the type of struggle we're in now, and there's no better ally any of us could have than Ellie Corey. So, Ellie, Thank why don't you, you give us? A few minutes presentation, then Duncan will, and then we'll uh, open it up for discussion. Well, I'm going to throw all the other hats that I have and keep one on, which is as a communicator, and one that lives in the Middle East, uh, and one that actually touches with all this stuff and try to um, tell you what I know. I intentionally made it into a paper that I'm going to read carefully because uh, I don't think there are many chances that I could talk to so many beautiful people about what I think or what we think in terms of people who work there should happen or should be communicated to the region for, for success. So this is really what I'm going to be focusing on, trying to put as much knowledge on the table possible, if one can call it knowledge. Okay. Thank you. All right. Do you want to you start? Well, almost 20 years ago to this day, the Berlin Wall fell and with it half a century of Cold War came to an end. Soon the leaders of the two poles of the Cold War met to state that 45 years of brutal, global, and ideological confrontation was over. And so nearly five decades of a global rift ended with a new horizon full of optimism. To a point where sociologists like Fukuyama announced the end of history, meaning the end of centuries of ideological wars and the conversions of all countries around representative democracy and the market economy. Ten years later, to last week as well, the sad events of September 11 erected a new wall of separation. This wall divided the same West, but with a different kind of East this time, an East classified as Islam. Another brutal, global, and ideological confrontation took shape, and then and one that we're still witnessing today. Regardless of the geopolitical circumstances surrounding the period, it was widely acknowledged that the wall of Berlin fell primarily because of the people of the communist East wanted an American dream of their own. Or at least wanted some of its basic forms. I mean Hollywood, Coca-Cola, Levi's. Another change agent was also at work, and that is public diplomacy. Can the same be achieved with the new wall created on September 11 of 2001? 
Well, the American dream, though may be exhausted a little bit by recessions of its own making, is still there. And so is public diplomacy. Some important questions, however, seem to persist. Are these enough tools to end yet another major global rift? Do they work with the Islamic version of the East? And if they do, do we have to wait a half century to reach a happy ending? Is the US a sellable brand to Islam, and especially in the Middle East? Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with the easy stuff. And don't worry, I won't get technical. Or worry if you're here just to get numbers. Does television have the required penetration to reach the people in question here? Where does radio, print, outdoor fit in? Most importantly, what about the internet and social media? Which one works better, advertising or content? Is professionally produced content more important than, gen than what is generated by the audience? Can Western global media play a role, or do we leave it to territorial or even local media? The answer is yes, and on all of the above. Because the fundamental principle of new media, or media as a whole today, is that all can reach one, and one can reach all. What you write on a blog or download on YouTube <coughs> And the privacy or lack of of your room can go anywhere and come back to you sometimes in multiples. The same way that anything you produce in some mega global media network can reach you in that very room. But how do we, do we deal with censorship, which might prevent the message from reaching its destination? The trick is somewhat easy. I'm not saying it is simple. It does require hard work. But there's no rocket science. The quality or relevance of your message is capable of surpassing the reach and censorship obstacles more often than we would like to believe. What people should read or see will eventually get to them, one way or the other. But with a complex media environment, audience variances, and potential weaknesses of reach add to its censorship, how widely can one reach and how effectively? Here are some few figures. The picture of reach is not as bleak as you might think. Let us take internet, for instance. Close to 20% of around 330 million people in, in the region, Middle East and North Africa alone, is now on the net. That's around 65 million. The internet penetration level of around 28% is slightly better than the world average of around 25%. And it is growing. Youth constitutes about 60% of these internet users. And if you want to get fancy, over 6 million internet users, or about 10% of that audience, have access to broadband networks. Also, over 8% of active Facebook users come from the Middle East and North Africa, while almost 4 in 5 of youth in the region own a mobile phone, and 1 in 4 own a web-enabled web -enabled one, etc., etc. But in my opinion, 65 million reachable people is not bad. Research also indicates that the single most important priority for young people in the region is living in a democracy, followed by infrastructure and access to higher education. The idea of global citizenship is also as important to almost 7 in 10 of young people. While contrary to perception, most bloggers in the region are producing country, not nation, i.e. Islamic Ummah, related content, and are mostly secular reformists. Islam-focused blogs constitute a minority, I would estimate 20%. But the most important catch is that only 1% of online content is in Arabic. Thus, the medium is available, but content is not. I am still talking reach here and relevance, but how about efficiency? On the nature and aspirations of the target audience, one would expect me to start by saying we must be aware of the complexity and diversity of the Islamic region or the Middle East, where one should pay careful attention to the nuances that lie between them and, 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 in essence, agreed. But it, is the audience split merely by region, creed, or gender? Or are there cross-territorial and gender common denominators? To make the point, let me go back to where I started. Or to the difference between the Berlin Wall that fell and the September 11 Wall that is still out there. The nature of the global divide, I would like to argue, is one and the same. To make an analogy, imagine that the Cold War was labeled Protestant or Catholic versus Orthodox, or believers versus atheists, just like it shouldn't be today about crusaders versus jihadists. It wasn't. 
It was about one way of life versus another. It was about the rule of law versus despotism. It was about liberty versus oppression. It was about personal prosperity versus state monopoly. Is the Islamic world an exception? Some in Washington would like to argue that what matters most in the West might not matter at all in the East. That the foundations of Western society, i.e. the rule of law, prosperity, democracy, excuse me for using the D word so much, and the likes are not necessarily what Muslims want. A few month, months ago, President Obama, in his famous and much appreciated Cairo address, stated, I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one based on mutual interest and mutual respect, <coughs> and, and one based on the truth that America and Islam are not exclusive and need not be in competition. Instead, they overlap and share common principles, principles of justice and progress, tolerance and the dignity of all human beings. Please do underline mutual here. I tend to agree with President Obama. He wasn't waiting for my agreement. <laughs> you see, for many of us who actually live the situation rather than read or inquire about it, there exists a great divide, and it's not between Christians and Muslims. The divide, believe it or not, is still the same as the one symbolized by the Berlin Wall. It is about a majority of moderates, Muslims or Christians, who are naturally pro-liberty, equality, and prosperity, versus a few who are attempting to use the Quran or Arabism as a substitute to the Communist Manifesto. I need a, something. Uh, <laughs> okay. Do you have a Kleenex or something? Uh, here. It's hot in here. There you go. Thank you very much. They are merely power mongers who are either in power and want to remain there, or those who are trying their luck. Some will use communisms, communism, others will use Arabism, and now Islamism. Don't be fooled or let anyone fool you by the wars of civilization, or as much as with the Islamic exception. Every human being, Christian or otherwise, wants what we all here want. The difference is merely in terminology. If I cannot get what is rightfully mine through Adam Smith, I will try, for lack of better options, to get, get it through Nasser, few decades ago, or through Islamism to nowadays. It is not about the rule of law versus Sharia. It is not about tolerance or respect. It's about mutuality. It is about, am I entitled to an American dream of my own or not? It is about, am I a world citizen at par with another, or am I the underdog? Sincerity, ladies and gentlemen, is the key issue. Because while in diplomacy, pragmatism is the main factor, in public diplomacy, it is sincerity that matters most. The former may serve as a short-term purpose, but the latter will advance the long-term objective. Where we, we as the free world, sincere in our message to beyond the Iron Curtain, if we were, let us then repeat the same sincerity with a new metaphysical curtain. Here's a view from a place and a society where the two cultures or civilizations, if you wish, are next door neighbors i.e. Beirut, where the dialogue of cultures, or their war for that matter, are conducted not from afar, not through experienced or experimental study and examination, and not th through regular visits or in-depth examination. They are conducted on daily basis and even hourly. They are your business meeting or lunch break. They are your night out with friends or the love affair with your high school sweetheart. A respected scholar and an ex-public servant from Lebanon, Ghassan Salemi, once said, with respect, you recognize the other's otherness, but you keep him at a distance. You exclude him from your sphere, his otherness being a shield separating him from you and protecting you from him. With tolerance, you not only recognize the other's otherness. However, with tolerance, there is also a source of frustration because implicit in it, is a balance of power in which the stronger side tolerates the existence of the other, as long as the other recognize, recognizes that he is only tolerated, that he basically is an inferior position. While in mutuality, you and the other become more like one, sharing the same or similar worries and aspirations, albeit in the diversities of individuals or societies, just like it is between America and Japan or as close as between Europe and America. Can we level with that remaining other? 
i.e. the Islamic East, and communicate with sincerity? If we can, then all the previously asked questions are achievable and would not take five decades. There is internet nowadays. <coughs> Mr. Salami goes on to say, Arab politics has never divided Arabs as much as it does today. That's true. But Arab culture, propelled and popularized by the new media, has never integrated them so closely. Many Middle Easts are concurrently being built today. And though it is hard to say which of those is going to ultimately have the upper hand, two conclusions can hardly be disputed. The first is that you cannot build a new Middle East if you have no idea of the old one. The second is that in order to reshape that part of the world, you need to do it with and for the Middle East, Middle Easterners, neither against them nor in their lieu and place. Though quite banal, these two basic rules have been largely ignored by the West in the recent past, opening the way for non-Western powers to get a rapidly growing foothold in the region, and more importantly, giving regional play players in the Middle East the chance to try and reshape it by and for themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, let us use all the available tools to the extent possible. Let us do it as soon as possible. Let us do it with sincerity. Let us tell the true American story. Let us tell them that what we are, that we are at par as human beings, and that what we have is also rightfully theirs, and that we as Americans are here to help, not because we are a greater nation, but because we, the people of the United States of America, can as well be we, the people of the Middle East. Let us stand firmly by the side of those who share our values, and not necessarily our opinion. In that, we establish credibility, i.e. respect. Let us also promote what we believe in, in, in to those who have not had the chance to see it the way we do. But let us do it with humility. In that we establish sincerity, i.e. affinity. Let us make the bulk of them see the bright side of possibilities for the future that lie in the same values we aspire to. In that there is mutuality. In that there is the ultimate bonding and that is trust. Establish trust, and you establish hope. And by that, all walls and curtains will fall, just like the Berlin Wall. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know. Thank you. It's hot in here. Great. Now we see why you were such a great leader of the Cedar Revolution. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, in order to uh, further the goals that Ellie talked about, which is outreach, social media, bringing people together. Secretary Clinton created a group that she called the Partners for a New Beginning, mm -hmm. uh, which fortunately uh, she asked Tony Verstandig, who's sitting there at the Aspen Institute, to help be the, se to be the secretariat of and to run it. And so this type of dialogue we're having is part of a launch of a Partners for a New Beginning, where we try to create partnerships, both in terms of NGOs, media, mm -hmm. and business, as we did with the U.S.-Palestinian partnership with various uh, groups uh, in the region. The Secretary of State has been particularly strong in this notion of outreach, especially using media to do so. And Duncan McInnes is um, at the forefront of that. Uh, your career foreign service, so you uh, actually, I think, started when uh, in this uh, battle of ideas uh, when you set up the Rapid Response Unit after 9-11, right, and the, um, the whole notion of communicating then. But now, as the director, your bureau is the one that's doing, uh, really at the forefront of social media, using the internet, using uh, various user-generated social networks to help uh, create uh, an understanding of the U.S. role in the world in our foreign policy. So maybe you could talk on that if you Thank would, you. sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll use the podium sure. too. But I wanted to um, thank the Aspen Institute for, for having me today, and Tony for, for inviting me, and uh, my panelists, Walter and uh, Illy. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say, you talked about the fall of the Berlin Wall, and, uh, and I was around in the Forest Service <laughs> around that time. And things have changed immensely since then. And what we've actually seen is the fall of another wall, which is the wall of isolation that, that existed when state-controlled media was the only way to get information in many countries around the world. And the, we really have the 
end of isolation in some way <coughs> through the social media tools that people are, have access to now, which Ellie talked about so eloquently, and how that will be changing the way that people can express their aspirations. And it, it's really an, an incredibly exciting time to be working in this field and, uh, and to be working on issues of democracy and empowerment. Um, let me, I'm gonna talk a little bit about an overarching what we're doing and then I'm gonna get very specific and give you some real, real life examples of, of how, what we're doing, which I think is sometimes useful in illustrating. Um, in, in revamping public diplomacy for the 21st century, the Under Secretary of Public Diplomacy, Judith McHale, uh, came up with a, a strategic framework <coughs> which outlines the way forward for us to be using our somewhat limited resources uh, of, uh, in, in reaching out to people through both, not just new media, but traditional media and exchanges and, and all the ways we do it. Um, but it makes, it makes public diplomacy part of the whole policy making, policy advocacy process at the Department of State. It is a common saying that the military fights today's wars with weapons from the last war. And the Iraq insurgency, for instance, gave a wake up to our military that they needed to develop a new way of fighting and they developed a counterinsurgency methodology that proved powerful in Iraq and is now being used in Afghanistan. Well, public diplomacy faced the same wake up call bell with powerful new media technologies and a prevalent and pervasive anti-Americanism that had sucked the oxygen out of what we were doing overseas in public diplomacy. Uh, like our military brethren, we need to develop our own new strategy for doing public diplomacy in the 21st century. And the Secretary of State has been very adamant that we need to do that and we have the, we have the full backing and inspiration to do so. Um, we, I come from a bureaucracy <coughs> not known for its uh, fleetness of foot or ability to change, not known for its risk taking, which are all aspects we need to have in doing this new job of using new social media effectively to communicate. Um, one of the things that is so inspiring about new social media is that it enables us to do what I view as the core function of what we do overseas, which is engaging people in the kinds of conversations that allow them to hear what we're saying and us to hear what they're saying and creating a, a dialogue. And that has been missing in the past. It's now, I think, <coughs> firmly established under the Obama administration. And that's, that was the message that the President has been sending to the world. Um, I think the most exciting part of what we're doing is when we get all the parts working together well. Uh, one thing I should talk about is that new media is particularly useful for us because we have very little money, very little resources, comparatively. I mean, I think Coke probably spends more than one day on their advertising than we spend in a year worldwide. But new media allows us to do things more cost effectively, to reach a larger group of people with less cost and actually in, in a way that actually does engage them. I mean, a broadcast media like television is a very important medium. Television is still the most widely used medium and the most powerful in the world today, but it is a one-way medium. It's not a two-way. Whereas uh, interactive web things are two-way and uh, social media networks are two-way. And where I could personally, uh, when I'm serving overseas, have a a base of maybe 500 to 1,000 people I, I will work with regularly. Uh, with new media, you can make that 10,000. And uh, that's it's hugely empowering and also le leveraging for us. Um, I want to talk about the President's speech in Cairo, uh, President Obama's speech in Cairo, and, about the, and I'm going to talk about all the things that we did on the new and social media side to assist in getting that message out, but also to engaging people in what that message meant to them and how we could, how it would be changing the way we were doing business. Um, the first thing we did with the White House's support was set up a CMS text message, I mean, a, a text messaging uh, 
basically worldwide call and dial in number where you could text in to the president a question, but more importantly, you text in your number and we would send you, in your language, information about the speech, excerpts from the speech, and where to go to have discussions about the speech. And we did that in English, Arabic, Persian, Urdu, Dari, Punjabi, Russian, Turkish, Hindi. So this was, these were like, these were short text messages that went out about the president's speech, and we got, re and we got feedback on the speech through that. Um, that was, I believe, perhaps <coughs> the first time we've had a global, uh, it's the first time we've had, but maybe the first time anybody's had a global text messaging campaign. Um, we did it again in Ghana to more success because we had learned a lot from our Cairo experience. Uh, we have a, a platform that we've developed that lets us do interactive multimedia web discussions with large groups of people. Uh, it uses an Adobe platform and then we call it Connects. And that team that day uh, ran this speech in a, in, a, in a box, but before the speech they were up for two, uh, four hours before the speech and several hours afterward. Taking discussion, <laughs> discussing this, what's going to be, the president was going to be talking about, discussing the speech while it was going on, and then discussing it uh, afterward. As the speech was running, people would text in about it. And we had 18,000 comments from people in over 50 countries. And the impact of that initiative was best summed up by Robert McKay in the New York Times article the next day. And he wrote, if you follow the State Department's global live web chat, mm -hmm. you might have gotten the impression that an era of peace and goodwill was at hand. Tens of thousands of words of comment flooded into the chat room, seemingly from nearly every country on Earth, almost all of them positive, and some is gushing as the, this post from an Egyptian named Nas Noor, which was, we want Obama to rule Egypt. <laughs> anyway, the total cost of this public diplomacy effort was $123.11. I mean, you can't beat that. <coughs> That's something we, for us to do that any other way would have been impossible, okay? And that's the kind of power that it's given us, and it's given the people to be able to talk to us. <coughs> We also have a digital outreach team, which is a group of uh, nine Arab and two Urdu and one, um, two, two Urdu and, sorry, it's 11 now, two Urdu and two Persian bloggers who go into the blogosphere and go on to discussion forums that are pre-existing, where people are discussing these issues or on blogs, mm -hmm. and in language, talk about the issues with them. And when we started this, we thought, oh, we're gonna get killed, we're gonna get we're going to get flamed by people and tell them, go away. What we actually got was, we hate your policies, but we're really glad you're here because we've never talked to an American before. We've never had anybody actually come and talk to us. And they signed their first names and Department of State, so they're official. Uh, they have done thousands of, in, of postings. They've been picked up by BBC's online, by Al Jazeera's Arabic online, the, they had a big discussion with uh, Ahmadinejad's press secretary that he published in the newspaper that actually made him look really bad and us look really good because they did the full text of what we had texted out to them. So it was really, it, that, so they also, for the president's speech, texted out and went on the net and, and went into the discussion forums and, and did comments. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Facebook uh, page, of course, and a Twitter program and we doubled our fan base in two days from the president's speech. And we, our click-through rate for Twitter was 20%, which is fantastic for us, at least. And the hashtag we set up was the most popular topic on Twitter that day. Mm -hmm. um, on, on our web pages, America.gov, we had a dedicated web page we had the speech up in, in multiple languages, 16, with video and audio files of the speech. I was surrounded by articles of life, think, of, of information about life in the United States, about Muslims in the US, and other things we thought our audience would be interested in. Um, and we did podcasts. We had a communicator's toolkit, which was for use by people overseas at our post. It's, uh, and they went out and they uh, were able to get all the information they wanted. And 
that was just one event. Okay. Well, great. So, I, I, uh, it'd be great to open this up if we could to some discussion and maybe we'd hear some more of that. I do want to, um, I see Jeff Tremble, who's the executive director of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. The BBG oversees uh, Voice of America, Alhara, um, Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe, um, Radio Marty. So it's trying to do that, as I think I've mentioned Steve. I was going to ask Ellie the first question, then maybe open up, maybe even Steve wants to say something about what VOA is doing. But you watch quite a bit Al Jazeera, uh, Al Arabiya, I think uh, Melum is here, um, and um, some of the others. What would you be doing now if you were trying to do international broadcasting? Um, I would actually replicate what I was saying here. Mm. Create a real open and sincere situation whereby uh, quality of the product and relevance mm -hmm. is is very important. One thing I would avoid is I would avoid giving it any official tone. I'll make it real public and real private sector-ish, mm -hmm. if you want. And it would have, um, you know, opening Pandora's box compare on Compare what issues. Al Jazeera is doing with the other networks, or compare all the networks. Well, um, the news network. Well, Al Jazeera is uh, first; it's very well funded, uh, that's for sure. So the quality of the production is high up there, mm -hmm. and uh, they are also sort of yellowish, if you want. I.e., they're sensational. They follow the beat, not the news. It's more of a views situation than a news situation, which gives them popularity. But if you really want to consider a TV that is mainstream, that would be Al Arabiya. That looks, feels, talks, and has the quality of mainstream media. While Al Jazeera, with all the money and the, if you want, the packaging, which we've done some at one stage, uh, is sensational. I would avoid that, but I would go a bit more than the mainstream and be more open, especially about some of the Pandora's boxes mm -hmm. of the region and of that, that dialogue mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. How would you have covered the mosque issue in the moment? Oh, I would have actually put it out there and put the views as they are of both parties mm -hmm. and uh, moderate them to some sort of a conclusion. A conclusion really would, would, to me at least, would be that both parties were at wrong. Mm -hmm. And there is always a better way of bridging with people. Be it if you're the one who wants to build the mosque or e if, if you're the one who's resenting building the mosque there. I think the presentation of the issue was wrong, and the refusal was also presented wrong as well. Mm -hmm. Steve, did you want to add something? Um, I was just curious about uh, how you would um, how you how you would how you would engage audiences uh, in, with new media, with social media, and what are the Arabic language networks um, doing in that in that distribution? Realm? Yeah, the social media yeah. field. Um, um, let me talk out of experience here, not just theories. Uh, to talk about just, uh, if you want, uh, web or social media and the likes is, I wouldn't say is, is sufficient and efficient. It's the whole combination, and I'll tell you why. You might throw a story there on the smallest blog you could figure out, and that story would be picked up the next day by the biggest TV or the biggest newspaper. And those are circulating around them. So you create a whole cloud around one story. That's what gets things done. But if you're just talking to the 65 million or, or so uh, on the net, and some of them are not there, and some of them don't have access to, you got to play the game where it allows, that's why I said quality and, and uh, relevance, that allows other uh, media to pick up on it conventional or non-conventional, or online or offline. I think that's what really, uh, that's the, the easy trick I was talking about in, in, in this paper. Doug, did you want anything to that? Or? Um, all those broadcast media have their own uh, online presence now because it's so important, just like we, he we do here mm -hmm. with the New York Times and others. And I think that it's, it's a very important place for their futures. I mean, it's, it, for them, it's part of their, grabbing their audience and holding them close, uh, and I think that's a it's a fruitful place to be, to be because it's a two-way place as opposed to the one-way broadcast, and I think it gives them that two-way thing, which is so important 
for keeping your audience engaged and also getting feedback on your program? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark Kimmett, uh, Mark, yeah, and why don't you uh, tell people who you are, too? Yeah. I'm Mark Kimmett, formerly Department of Defense, formerly yeah. Department of State, formerly U.S. military. Basically, guy can't keep oh, a job. <laughs> we have a lot of people come to lunch who, you know, go through a lot of jobs. Yeah. Uh, so let me be candid. Understand the approach of the Obama administration. Understanding, embracing the new media. Uh, but if one takes a look at a few research polls, since Cairo, the numbers have gone down. So let me turn to my client, my, my advertising firm, Quant, and say, what are we doing wrong? How do we employ these new media to better effect? Uh, how do we fix this problem? Because the numbers are going in the wrong direction for this process. Uh, yeah, let me be honest about it too, and then I'll be formerly in this room. <laughs> um, it is uh, really, at the end of the day, if it's uh, one way, if it's coming out of some sort of an official or a government uh, effort, it is what these guys over there see every day. They're, in fact, they're bombarded by government-controlled media. Though it, not, not, it might not be the right term to say it's controlled, but it's coming from somehow, and people can tell if it's coming somehow from a government uh, effort. Therefore, there is a certain degree of, again, sincerity. And uh, it, it is called public diplomacy at the end of the day. So the term sort of implies cheekiness, lying, or not telling the truth. It has to be public, uh, a private sector, I mean. And if I were to theorize about this, I would say that the US government should probably empower private sector to actually do that on their behalf. Not necessarily on their behalf in line with the message because believe it or not there are many media people uh, in that region who are happy to deliver the same message of call it tolerance respect and whatever and get the same things done and even more fervently well, that's right. explain what you mean contract out to them meaning paying journalists contract or yeah there is always a good form of engaging the professionals of the region who actually want to do so and want to have that freedom of expression, if you want, rather than be in a state-controlled television or newspaper that allows them a very uh, minimum margin. What I'm trying to say is, at the end of the day, you're almost repeating what they are suffering from. It's a state message, and they're receiving yet another one. Ideally, let the private sector speak on your behalf, because anyhow, they will do that. When you give them the freedom, they're going to end up talking like you. Mark, you're an expert on this. Do you want to uh, offer your own thoughts? Well, I'd just like to go back to uh, the fall of Berlin Wall. I mean, clearly, the most important components were Coca-Cola, Levi Strauss, Elvis Presley, and the Beatles. Um, but we didn't subsidize them. We didn't encourage them. Uh, but those same aspects of Western democracy, Western culture, those resonated in way that they did in East, Central and Eastern Europe. Is it just that we need to give it time? Because clearly our ability to talk to the people in the Middle East far surpasses our ability to talk to the people in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, clearly we, we suffer from the same problem, is that any voices that were talking on the other side of the Berlin Wall were characterized by the Soviets as American propaganda. So in, in many ways we had the same tools now far more capable than we did back then. It, it just doesn't seem to be working as quickly as we would like it to. And uh, I'm asking the question. I'm, I'm, I have no allow, allow me to give you one technical question and one uh, conceptual. The technical thing, if I recall well, most of the activities that were activist sort of sending no, messages can. behind the curtain were NGOs that were characterized as uh, 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 NGOs from the ground who are, who, have, uh, who are activists. They were not characterized as government agents. Yes, of course, the first thing that communists will do or uh, 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 their, their, common, uh, their friends in the Middle East, they will label you as imperialist, Zionist, blah, blah, blah. That, that, that goes without saying. In fact, you should start, when you start talking about this subject, you, sh you should say that I'm one of those so we can surpass that and <laughs> get to business. Uh, 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 
so it didn't sound as much as a government effort. That's on the technical side. But again, on the conceptual side, I tried to really uh, illustrate what I meant by sincerity. If you, if you uh, notice the tone of voice and the messages that, that, that the West talks to the East, it is though as the East is just, is, is another, is a, you know like when you're speaking to a, an American Chinese and you're trying to speak in a loud uh, English and slow English, only to find out that he comes from New York. <laughs> this is how America sounds to these people. We love you. <laughs> we should be doing business together. No, if you have to really do it with, we're mutual, we're, we're the same bunch of people. You're probably darker than me or whatever, but we're the same bunch of people at the end of the day. And that, there is no chart or figures that could uh, uh, give you a formula on that. It's the gut, it's how you say it, it, it what you're trying to say. Mustafa, yeah. introduce yourself too, if you would. From uh, Abu Dhabi, right? Abu Dhabi at the moment, but okay. full time hmm. for 32 years in London. You mentioned Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera. I would really take the BBC as an example to follow if you want really to learn how to deliver the message to the world. They are doing extremely well, especially the newly established BBC Arabic. I think people in the Middle East, that is, since you're talking about the Middle East, at least now, trust the BBC. You would watch Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, and maybe other channels and radio, but you would end up listening to the BBC to make sure whether the other broadcasts have been saying the truth or not. Is that because the BBC is so credible? So credible. Credibility is really the key okay. issue. Second, when you want to deliver a message, uh, there is a bit of confusion. Uh, the, the US uh, uh, supported media tend to, if you allow me to use this word, to, to uh, <coughs> promote government interest rather than the country's interest. There's a great deal of difference. Now you have an opportunity, in my view, with Obama in the White House. It's a great event worldwide. Duncan mentioned the girl Nora Deja, who would like to have Obama to run the country. This is the feeling everywhere. Obama phenomena has presented the world with a kind of proposal. I think the US media should take advantage of this and explain to the world how a person like Obama reached the White House and before him, between brackets, of course, the evil man Bush was also at the White House. You know, it's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, argument, a very interesting debate, a very interesting piece of information you present to the world, especially in the Arab world, that this same nation had Bush, who was in Iraq, who did that, who did this, but also delivered Obama to the White House, who no people like me would like to have mm -hmm. as a president to run their country. Thank you very much, Mustafa. And then right there, I think there was a uh, question or comment. Well, I'm one of those people that believe that if you entrust government to women, they'll do a much better job. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't know, you probably have seen. We have a lot of data points on that. Yeah, <laughs> what are we doing tonight? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, I forgot the name of that video clip that uh, talks about the same thing. I'm a firm believer in that. When it comes to our organization, we we happen to also publish a, uh, a website called Now Lebanon. Believe it or not, most of the responsibles, those who run it, are women, and they're doing an excellent job. And this goes, I think, I haven't done any looking into the matter. This goes to as many, uh, uh, if you want, media outlets as I know. Uh, in Beirut, in uh, Al Arabiya, in Dubai, in, in many places, there are many women in key places, and I think 
they do a good job, and, and I truly believe in, in sincerity at least, they do much better job than men. I don't know if that, uh, yeah. but please do get engaged more and as much as you can. Judith? Uh, Walter, I want to ask you a question you can't a answer, but I'll <laughs> put it on the table anyway, and uh, nice to see you, Ellie. Nice to see uh, you, too. You mentioned all of the BBG's projects, all radio except for El Hura. If we have the representative from the State Department telling us that he reached X number of thousands of people for $123, El Hura is not a success. It is state television in Arabic. As an American citizen, I personally uh, don't believe in it. Uh, what, after all these years of it not reaching the core audience that we're looking for, the new media being so much more effective and less expensive, what's the justification for the American taxpayer to pay for Al Hora? I don't you, think you can answer it, what, but what I want to say something. What is your feeling about Al Hora's role? Well, um, it depends also. Uh, there, there was a bit of, uh, I'm going to be honest as well. There's going to be, uh, there is a, the Al Hurra quality has varied in, 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 uh, in, in at times. At times it did somewhat well, at times it did not do well. Yes, I would be like you, uh, not very much in tune with a, something sponsored by a government. I would like to, make, to, to have something that feels more private sector. But mind you, as I was saying in the paper, any effort, even if it reaches a certain a small number of people, is good. And if you work in the media field today spe specifically, really the line is, is, is very blurred because if you want to put a, say, talk show or documentary, uh, if you want to webcast it on, 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 the web, on a website, you might as well shoot it for a broadcast situation. So cost-wise, if you want to really get, unless you're doing social media, which is just uh, you know, uh, kid stuff or, or uh, amateur stuff, the cost will always be the same. So I'm saying is, Reaching out, no matter which way, is good. All I'm calling for is multiple channels of reaching out and including a much larger uh, private sector element. In fact, I would have wished that Al Hurra would produce high standard relevant material and be legally able to <coughs> distribute it to other media networks. Because at the end of the day, it's not whether you have a channel or not, it's the content that you're sending out. Uh, to answer your question, from our perspective, we went out the new broadcasting board to Middle East Broadcasting out in Virginia to see the new programming. And it is a question of having, in my mind, really good programming. That uh, if that programming gets more credible and more interesting, more people will watch it. And uh, clearly, you have to leapfrog into a social media environment as you're doing that. And you may not need to do as much broadcast forever, but you need to put real quality on the parts you do. Let me ask Jeff in the way back. Uh, thank you, Judith. Let me ask Jeff Trimble in the way back to any facts you may have on Al Hura. Sure. Well, first, I, I think everybody on the, on the board welcomes dialogue about, about Al Hura, and there are a lot of Al Hura colleagues here today, in fact, who'd be happy to, to chat more about, about Al Hura. Um, somebody's raised kind of the syndication model as maybe being a way to go. Yeah. I think that's something that the new board has talked about. That's a little bit what Ellie and, just and said. Exactly. I think it was somewhat mm -hmm. in the subtext of Judith's mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. which is maybe instead of producing all the programs, you can syndicate uh, things that work that are not government mm -hmm. voice programs. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about the yeah. research on Al Hur as well, and we're happy to Can't walk see. around yeah. in that subject with anyone who'd like to chat about it. The most of the Al Hur research is done by AC Nielsen, some's done by D3 Systems in the countries where there are conflicts uh, underway. But um, Al Hura, by historical standards in US international broadcasting, has been a huge success uh, in terms of attracting sheer audience. The audiences of Al Hura now are about 25, 26 million a week. Is that right, Deirdre, you hear? Yeah. Something like that. And together with Sawa, the audience that they're drawing in Arabic speaking in the 22 countries, to which they broadcast about 35 million. And that's about twice the measured audience of BBC Arabic at this time. So, um, and again, we're happy to walk around in the research and have really detailed discussions. And I think this board really welcomes the outside interest and involvement to carry on the discussion further. Too. Despite we're everything Jeff about. said, there's no complacency as if everything None is, whatsoever. is just fine. Yeah. We, we understand that in everything we do, we're always trying to push it forward. Ed, but where's Ed? Is he here?
Yeah, I know he has had that. Ed's been doing so much in this. I, I thought I'd try to sure. give him uh, a shout out at least. <laughs> thanks, Walter. Uh, so Ed Bice, uh, I'm the founder of the Median Project. Uh, we're translating Arabic media. We've got young journalists <laughs> and translators working every day to, to not only uh, target English media in, in, for an Arabic audience, addressing the 1% issue that Ellie raised, but also uh, going the other way. So I wanted to bring the point forward that the, the technology is really, the good news is the technology, the social media technology is trending in the right direction. And we're going to have uh, more global networks, more diverse networks. Um, what we need to address is the silos that are still happening, that, that are linguistic silos uh, in, in one case, but, but also when we think about promoting uh, different uh, you know, regional media outlets that are credible or, or uh, VOA's properties, we have to start taking conversations across these different properties. And, and this is it's a technical challenge, but it's starting to happen. So, how do we encourage that? Um, you know, and, 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 and really, I, I think the, the third point I want to make is, is, is in echoing Ellie's point, it, it's we can't fix this. If, if the we is the US government, we can't fix this problem. The, the US government stands to be the great beneficiary of, of these changes in the technologies and these, 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 uh, the, 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 the general new media landscape. But to the extent that the U.S. government tries to insert itself as a conduit for this, um, conversations around the Obama speech, terrific. But programs that, that, that create content and come from states are not regarded as credible in, in the region. Right. So, and so, Ed, let me ask you a couple of questions on that real sure. quick. Do you think that the technology, suppose we're in 62 languages and we want conversations in real time in which people yep. can participate in all languages, to what extent are we going to see language translation uh, technology or the crowdsourcing yep. of language uh, translation that will work to create a 62 language dialogue in real yeah. time? So it's been, it's been from the start of the, the uh, computer age. This in other words, ever since Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage tried to do it in the 1890s? Yeah. Uh, uh, some, somewhere after the, okay. uh, the, the edition. But uh, <laughs> the, the story of translation has always been the story that the technologists have told. And, and the implications are profound. What we're seeing, and, and we're, we're involved with IBM and Google and some, some big efforts to, to crack the the uh, crack the code on this. What we're seeing is dramatic improvements over the last five years in when technology we, or in, in translation technology. And there is going to be a profound change in another five years. We're going to have acceptable quality translation into and out of a bunch. And what of will languages. that do to social public diplomacy media? So that that's one piece of the puzzle. That makes the content accessible. Okay, that means anyone in the Arab world who wants to read uh, not only the, the content produced on, on the New York Times site, but also the commentary can, can do that. So that's, that's one piece. But the second piece is bridging the conversation that's happening on the Times site with the con conversation that's happening in Cairo uh, underneath the Al Hamram site. And, and until we start to bridge those, you know, that, that they'll remain silent. So uh, what we're seeing with Twitter, um, what we're seeing with technologies that allow us to geolocate and, and timestamp opinions that are coming out, I mean, the, the, the dream for us, which would be a dream for the State Department, would be somebody reads the New York Times and is able to, and, and the article references Cairo, they're able to see what people in Cairo are saying about that event um, by simply pivoting off the Times uh, site to a, a list of social media that's being generated and tagged to that article. So, you know, this is kind of long view, but it's it's probably where we're going to end up with new media. And we're, we're yeah. Let me uh, go here, and then I saw in the back. Oh, is that Michael? 
Yeah, on the way back. Hey, Michael. Thank you. My name is Noam Katz. I'm uh, doing public diplomacy for the Israeli Embassy, and was, I was the head of strategic communication for Israel, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I have a few comments to say. I will start Please. with engagement. Engagement is important, but it's a tool, and it's a tool for an end. And what we would like to help to social media in relation, uh, and we want to develop this kind of relation in order to influence, and influence is measured by change. So you need to find clear measurement. Why well, you put your mic close to your mouth here? Yeah. It's all right, just close. So you need to develop close measurements and to follow them, to see whether you are on the right track. And if you don't define well your objective, you don't know who your target audience, then you speak to everybody, you speak to nobody. Especially with uh, social media, that is a global world. Yes, no borders, but people are more and more interested and focused on the issue of their interest. If you are interested in sport now, you don't have to watch CNN. <coughs> you find the sport channels or the sport uh, news or the sports forum. And if you are interested in specific sport, you go there. So you need to know what you want to achieve. For example, if I wanted, and that's something that we did in Israel, to give greater exposure to the Israeli society with different audiences around the world. So we went for school. And we developed a program that will give students uh, in high schools academic credit for them handling relations with foreigners on social media. Content was not important, as long it was something that was done for a whole year. Hopefully it will be continued, and basically it is using already the interest of the kids to interact. It's easy credit. How many are doing it? Uh, we started with a small program of a few hundred, and now it goes for the thousands. Interesting. Now, the idea is that I want an Israeli kid to be a friend with uh, a kid. I don't know where. In Britain, in Lebanon, because they can meet there and speak about the things that they really like. <coughs> the government doesn't care what are their opinions. If they will speak about politics eventually, let's say that we'll have another escalation like we had with Lebanon in 2006. So they will speak about that and they will have different opinions, but they will communicate. And because they know each other from before, they will trust better each other and they will be able to understand each other. Now, you have to understand that when we deal with public diplomacy, Usually, because we are diplomats, we are interested in political influence. Right. <laughs> so it's a different set of parameters. I'm not sure that when you influence public, you necessarily influence uh, government policy. We can have, and that's something that I can say, we have great support, public opinion support today in Russia. It's because Israel is exposed to the Russian audience. It's exposed to the many emigrants that came from Russia. It's exposed by the Israeli TV and media channels in Russia that are broadcast in Russia. It's exposed by the level of tourists that are coming for a day trip in Israel. So people are familiar. I would say that today Russia knows Israel or the Israeli reality better than Americans. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't influence necessarily the policies of the Kremlin. Eventually. And the same, and the same with China. Let me let you wrap up because yep. I have got some other. Okay. In fact, so uh, Michael Mann in the way back is oh, one of our. I'll end here. Yeah, thank you very much. Also a member of the Broadcasting Board and from the Senate, and I think a microphone's coming behind you. Thanks, Walter. Um, one thing I just wanted to pick up on someone made a great comment about how far the technology's come in the last five years. And, uh, and as a new board member of the, of the BBG, we have this task of reviewing the strategy of taking a 70 year old entity, the Voice of America, and moving it forward, yet uh, Congress is telling us we're going to have a less money to do so. So as you, as, as some of your comments I just wanted to pick up upon, you know, I hear you about the government being a place, you know, government broadcast is a hard place to go, but the New York Times example is people come for reliable news and then enter into a social dialogue. And it's sort of what, what do you think of that type of a model looking forward on some of the, some of the various entities that we need to deal with? You are definitely able to, uh, if you want, surpass the, the, the obstacle of whether you are somehow funded by a government or not. I have to repeat myself by saying it's really the quality of the material. 
anybody could be pr uh, producing that material. If it's honest, if it's sincere, if it touches and is, is relevant, it'll get to people. Now, yeah, there could be, uh, oh, this is funded by the American taxpayers, or this is, uh, there is an Iran television now uh, uh, happening, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you could surpass these uh, at times. If I want to go back to al hurra specifically, I think catching up with technology, especially on the web and all the means that allow you to spread as much as possible, that would be uh, item number one that should happen. Second is really the quality and relevance and sincerity of the product itself. And then everything else will be good. Um, I would like to comment a little bit about the whether you're what, the paper I wrote here is entitled Diplomacy versus Public Diplomacy. And this is where people tend to mix the two together. In public, in, in diplomacy, you're trying to achieve a, a, a government uh, change of policy, or you're trying to convince on a short term. But in public diplomacy, you're trying to influence people. But we need not to forget that public diplomacy, if successful, can pressure diplomacy in the right way as well. <laughs> yes, sir. My name's um, David Kenner. I work for Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, this is a question for you, Ali. Um, I, I'm a great admirer of yours and your work in Lebanon to try to bring democracy, independence, sort of uh, respect for the Lebanese state. This isn't an argument you won from March 2005 to May 2008 if you just look at events in Lebanon now. Again. What, going back in those three years, what would you have done differently, do you think? How would you have made your argument differently, both in Lebanon and to the American public? Well, and since you just said, and things are getting interesting, yeah. tonight we'll look at the next year, too. <laughs> exactly. um, I don't think the message is, uh, that was the issue. In fact, sorry, I must have the <laughs> I can hold it, it's okay. Uh, it wasn't the message, and I'll give you an example that you're probably close to. In the last elections, whereby, technically speaking, you would have said March 14 was almost lost, they won the election. Because you were able to remind people that it wasn't about the politicians, it was about what's behind that. I personally don't think that that battle is lost. Politically, i.e. diplomatically, yes, because of different uh, environment uh, in, uh, in the region because different American policy or Western policies. There are too many circumstances that are not allowing the only grassroots, true gra grassroots situation that happened in the Middle East or in the world recently, uh, uh, Beirut, for it to actually achieve its, its goals. I gave a speech a while back and I said what I've learned from the Cedar Revolution is that unless the leaders of the world uh, speak about it and talk about it, the media doesn't follow. And that's very cynical uh, of the media itself. And I ended up by saying uh, people are willing to pay the price of freedom dearly. Uh, the, the, the leaders of the world should just pay attention. And I think March 14 and the Cedar Revolution have lost attention of the leaders of the world, and that's why it is weakened. Other than that, I think the people want still the same thing and want to reach it there. Of course, you might say there are some technical mishandling by politicians, but guess, but guess what? I mean, if you entrust politicians with democracy, they're going to prove they are politicians. Which is what's happening now with uh, Hariri in Syria? Uh, that, I think, has a bit, a bit deeper okay. reasons than, uh, than just mere maneuver, if you wish. Uh, the the outcome of the uh, uh, tribunal for Lebanon might have a big, big pressure on Lebanon. And maybe maybe one of the wisdoms says you might want to minimize the amount of enemies that are after you. Not a bad wisdom to have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to thank you all very much. And let's uh, have a more informal conversation. People can come forward and talk. It's really great. I want to thank Jim Pickup, who helps uh, put together our Lebanon program, as well as many other things at DLA Pipe.